Well, Daron Ajemolu, MIT professor, recent uh, for Berliners ASK Social Science Award winner and um, and uh, above all, perhaps the technological change expert um, <clears throat> with many, well, with, with great research and, and many interesting books. It's great to have you in our Teta -tet today. Thank Welcome. you, Nicola. And uh, it's great seeing you again. Uh, for those of you who don't know, which is, I guess, most people, Nicola gave a very nice uh address for me when I was in Berlin last for the <laughs> uh, for that very nice ASK occasion. So thank you again, Nicola. Well, it was a pleasure. And our tete -a -tete always uh, starts the same way. Mm, well, where are you, uh, Daron? And what do you see when you look out of the window? Well, I am in my office at MIT in Cambridge. And uh, when I sit here and look out of the window, unfortunately, I see a bunch of buildings. If I go to the other end of the <laughs> office, uh, and then I can see the, uh, the the very nice Charles River. But unfortunately, right now, that's not what I see. <laughs> well, very close to Charles River, almost a Charles River view. That's that's uh, well, we we expected uh, nothing less in a way. But uh, yeah, we invited you to talk, of course, about uh, technological change, about your work on on poverty, prosperity, uh, power, you know, all the implications that technological progress can have um, and, and uh, well, your work to explore it. And perhaps it would be a nice way to start that you explain us a little bit that on what fascinates you about this research topic and what brought you there? Well, you know, I think there are so many pathways that brought me to where I am. Uh, but I would say I have always been fascinated by technological change because it's one of the most amazing things that humans do in uh, in a way that's, you know, really inspiring that we have advanced our relationship with nature in tremendously creative ways that you know, uh, our ancestors could not even dream of. But even more fundamentally, technological change has become the most important nexus of how our societies grow, develop, political, social, economic relations change. But also recently, meaning over the last 10, 15 years, I've come to realize something that perhaps I should have uh, recognized even earlier, that technological change is also very much about power relations, meaning that it empowers some people and disempowers others. And it is driven by the ability of some actors, political actors, economic actors, tech leaders, to impose their own agenda on the rest of us. And this, of course, became much more real for me when I started thinking more and more about Silicon Valley, especially in the context of social media and then later AI, because I noticed some of those trends and then it merged into my own work on automation and how automation has very unequal and sometimes impoverishing effects on some groups of workers. And, and the whole thing then started coming together in my mind, which is essentially the framework that later became uh, the basis of power and progress, the book I co-wrote with Simon Johnson. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating also because uh, for a simpl simplistic <laughs> OECD economist, you know, there's still the ideas in some ways, you know, that technological progress is the fundamental force driving um, progress and prosperity a little bit for everyone. And then you explored, um, perhaps going back a little bit into uh, your, um, you know, uh, work on economic history, how it sometimes does and other times doesn't so it, and which can of course be a rather simple but falsifiable theory of um 
well, of why some nations are rich and others are so poor. So do you think there's a, well, rather straightforward mechanism that explains why it sometimes works for many and sometimes just for a few? Well, uh, Nicola, first of all, I wouldn't say uh, that I disagree with any aspect of the your caricature of the OECD economist thinking. Yes, absolutely. I think technological change is the most important potential engine of progress, economic progress, health progress, progress in the ways that we are able to organize our lives. But where I start, and the second part of your question sort of started elucidating that, but where I begin is to observe that that good outcome is not automatic, that there have been periods in which technological advances have brought those fruits for us, rising living standards, better health conditions, better ability to uh, control uh, natural disasters. But there have also been periods in which technological advances have done the opposite. They have mm -hmm. created poverty. They have helped rather than cure disease. And the key aspect, of course, immediately you'll recognize is choice. We choose what to do with new ideas. We can understand the chain reaction and use that for nuclear weapons or for building nuclear reactors. And the key, of course, is that those choices are not made in a vacuum. And the two key aspects that my work and the book with Simon Johnson emphasize is that we have to get the direction of technology right, meaning that just scientific advances, just uh, expanding our knowledge isn't enough. We also have to make the right decisions about where to deploy these advances and in what directions to push the frontier. And second, all of this needs to be embedded in an institutional framework that creates the right types of checks and balances and countervailing powers so that the uh, uh, the the breakthroughs don't become weapons in the hands of a few against the many. So just to put a little bit of historical context into this, in the book with Simon, for example, uh, we do a deep dive into the history of the British Industrial Revolution. There is sometimes a uh, simplistic reading which says, look, uh, that was a disruptive change, but we all benefited from it, so what's the problem? And we point out that reality is very far from that. The first 190 to 100 years of the Industrial Revolution were quite rapid in terms of really transformative technological and social changes, but it created more inequality, more hardship, much worse health conditions, much worse working conditions. It was really a terrible time for the working people. Some people, mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs, the factory owners made a lot of money, became fabulously wealthy, but, uh, but, but for the majority of the population, these were not happy times. Mm -hmm. And then sometime around 1840s, things started changing. Why? Well, look at it. The direction of technological change altered. So much more things that would help workers become productive. This was embedded in a very different set of workplace relations in the first half of the 19th century, in the second half of the 18th century. Trade unions were banned and any kind of effort for collective negotiation by workers was suppressed. So starting uh, in the 1840s, trade union activity of one form or another intensified and in the 1870s, trade unions became legalized. Britain was a very oligarchic country, a very small fraction of people could vote. Starting with 1832, the first reform act, the franchise was extended and more and more people were voting. Uh, uh, ultimately, in the last quarter of the 19th century, all adult males and then later all adults, men and women, 
were given the vote. So that was a slow process, but it changed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it it changed the this countervailing powers, the uh, the 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 constraints on those who uh, who were already powerful in this society. I don't think it's an accident mm -hmm. that both political, social, and directional changes of technology, all of them had to take place in order for these better outcomes, higher growth in wages, investments in public infrastructure so that epidemics could be controlled, more investment in education, more rights for workers, more rights for children, all of these things, you know, you had to fight for them. Yeah. That, but that sounds, I mean, that begs an, a, a fascinating question, which you have worked on as well, because it sounds a lot like you're very, let's say, optimistic in the way that, well, we like to think also at the OECD, you know, that <laughs> democracy, market economy, et cetera, will bring about the kind of technological progress that helps the many. And I was going to say, well, but Britain is kind of a democracy, even at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but you can't, you know, you pointed out well, um, <clears throat> Maybe not so much on some some institutions like trade unions had to come about and more inclusive franchise, et cetera. But then the, on the other hand, we have, of course, seen a number of Asian countries develop very well in, a let's say, a non-democracy or more in, a, um, in, in systems that look perhaps very close to the benevolent uh, dictator that we sometimes have in economic uh, textbooks. But would you say democracy and let's say, the kind of technological progress that we aim for uh, go hand in hand? Because, you know, there, there's a big debate about that, right? Well, I wouldn't say, you know, the hand in hand might suggest a very organically natural relationship. Yeah. I wouldn't say hand in hand. But uh, first of all, uh, perhaps you're more knowledgeable than me. I, I am. I way are more, more, more knowledgeable than me, Nicola. Perhaps you've met some, but I have never met a benevolent dictator. <laughs> so I'm not going to pin my hopes on them. So the, the case in point is the Chinese Communist Party. You know, yes, China grew very rapidly for a while under the Chinese Communist Party, but they are very far from benevolent. So with, uh, with dictators, you have to hope two things, that they see it with their interest to allow and even sometimes propagate growth. And second, that their preoccupation with control and holding on to power doesn't become a barrier. And there are some historical reasons why this might happen, especially when dictators or autocratic groups or leaders feel that they have to grow the economy in order to gain legitimacy or prevent threats, such as mm -hmm. General Park in South Korea mm -hmm. or Kuomintang in Taiwan or the Chinese Communist Party. But but it doesn't always last and it does run into problems. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, you know, democracy is far from perfect. It's got a huge number of problems. But this is one of the areas that I have... Uh, research quite a bit and and what I find in uh, a series of works, especially in works I did with uh, my co-authors Suresh Naidu, uh, Pascual Restrepo and Jim Robinson, that even with all of its imperfections, on average, di democracies are better for economic growth than dictatorships. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you don't want to compare, you know, uh, China to Finland, that's comparing apples and oranges. So what we do is we look at countries that start autocratic and democratize, or the other way around, democrat start mm -hmm. democratic and they have a shock that reduces their democracy score or the quality of democracy, and then pursue uh, the strategy of tracing what happens to their economic growth, to their investments, to education, to health, and so on and so forth. And the bottom line is very uh, clear evidence that democracy is good for of overall growth and the type of growth that's uh, that's more favorable to uh, lower earning people. So, for example, a country that democratizes adds about twenty five to twenty twenty to twenty five percent increase in GDP relative to autocracies that don't democratize within twenty years, and they do so especially by investing in health, education, and redistribution. So, so I think 
if I'm going to take my chances, I'll take them with democracies. But democracies are not perfect. And new technologies of the sort that are in everybody's mind right now, such as AI, create problems both for autocracies and democracies. Mm -hmm. Well, for autocracies, it's problems for the people, not necessarily problems for the autocrats, because AI and all associated technologies appear to be very good for surveillance. You know, the Chinese Communist Party, again, uh, was a leader in understanding this. Uh, <clears throat> almost 10 years ago, they made a complete pivot and said, we're going to become a leader in AI. We're lagging behind in all sorts of digital technologies. But then the huge amount of money that they poured into this area, a very large fraction of it has gone to facial recognition, monitoring technologies, censoring technologies, and so on and so forth. So, so AI provides new opportunities for surveillance, more, more monitoring for repression. In democracies, on the other hand, I think AI has become a manipulation tool of a different sort, not in the hands of mm -hmm. governments, although governments have done their fair share uh, in the United States, definitely, but especially in, in the hands of private companies. Social media, I think, is not yesterday's news because I believe that the problems we have lived with social media are just a uh, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what the kinds of issues we have to confront with AI. And the business models haven't changed. So whatever made Facebook want to grow at breakneck speed without any guardrails and whatever made Facebook, uh, you know, tolerate all sorts of misinformation, extremism, manipulation, because so, so because they wanted to monetize people's data, I think those forces are still there and they're the major uh, engines of... Uh, venture capital and funding in Silicon Valley right now. So so I don't think we are talking of history when we are pointing out these problems. So what that means is that democracies were, quote, unawares about the challenges that AI and other advanced technologies would bring. So that's the sense in which, while I believe that democracy is in a much better position to shepherd technological change in a way that is beneficial for the people. Right now, democracies generally are quite unready to play that role, and they are being more and more severely challenged. Yeah, I mean, that's an important point. And, and I think I have several questions there. Well, one is, um, you know, when I'm thinking about do we have the institutions that we had in the later phases, of the Industrial Revolution, um, if you think about this breakneck uh, technological change with AI, right, it also comes about a lot, well, I mean, I think there's an opportunity of new players uh, <clears throat> emerging. At the same time, it looks as though the competition in, 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 in the digital sphere, let's say, is very, um, well, much uh, uh, dependent also on big network effects and the big companies tend to buy <laughs> uh, uh, also new competitors or people with who come up with new technologies. So it seems it's very much um, <clears throat> concentrated in a few hands, even in market economies and democracies. That's one thing. So, and, and I'm not sure how much they... <laughs> A further, for example, trade unions and, you know, large parts of societies, workers uh, shaping um, this technological progress with them to make sure it benefits many people financially or, and also democracy rather than harming a democracy because, um, as you pointed out, uh, social media can be um, a threat here too. And then the second um challenge is, of course, that with the breakneck technological progress that's global and globally many economies are competing to be the leaders, and not all of them are <laughs> democracies to begin with, you know, and it's a lot also about control over uh, critical resources, right? So 
is there are you optimistic they are pessimistic you don't know what are the what do we need to do so that this well you raised so many interesting issues uh nicola <laughs> so let me leave the global aspect of regulation aside for a second we should come back to that but because i think there are three different points that you raise in the first part of your question that i think are all critical one is do we have the right institutions you know during the <clears throat> industrial revolution we had to develop the institutions in fact you know britain was a leader in certain things you know they already had parliaments and so on yeah but you know mass politics trade unions uh, regulation uh uh, civil bureaucratic organizations that could deal with health problems, all of those had to be developed. And they weren't enough. And during the progressive era in the United States, we had to develop yet another set of institutions. In the post-war era, we had to develop yet another set of institutions, you know, all customer, consumer protection, uh, you know, all pharmaceuticals, uh, cars, you know, the many household appliances. They used to be death traps until, uh, you know, customer, consumer protection civil society led and then regulation regulator driven uh measures were taken in order to ensure safety and quality second how do we determine the direction of technology mm -hmm. you know that's central to my research and you've touched upon that but third separately from that you know how monopol how monopolized these markets have to be you know can we prevent the monopolization of tech markets and I think all of those are, are critical challenges. My, my take on each one of these three in 30 seconds each, so because <laughs> I don't want to take all of our remaining time. No, I don't believe we have the right institutions. We even, I think, have a more challenging task than people during the progressive era that they had to develop antitrust and more uh, direct election of senators and, and, and things like that, which I think were already understood that we needed uh, some guardrails against big companies, and uh, and 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 in the United States, people understood that the the lack of direct election of senators or lack of an income tax were, you know, political uh, decisions that were made earlier on in in on behest of previous elites' wishes. So now I think we have to develop much different institutions for regulating tech, regulating com companies that are much bigger today than anything we have seen, you know, much bigger than the standard oil and the trusts that, uh, you know, American regulators and then European regulators were dealing with at the beginning of the 20th century. So, so, so we have to sort of be on the ball on this and international organizations, OECD uh, uh, included, have a very important role to play in developing best practice and spreading the best practice, but it's also a domestic problem. And, you know, lawmakers have to wake up to that. The direction of technology is key. I think that's where we really need to have the right focus because you can use AI in a way that creates more inequality, automates works and uh, generates more unequal distribution of gains. It creates more monopolies. It creates more manipulation or AI actually has the potential to do the opposite. It has the potential to help workers. It has the potential to create new communication platforms that can be more pro-democratic, more privacy. So, so, so those directional choices have become much more important with AI. And then finally, on the issue of monopoly, you know, it's a separate question. It's not the same as the direction because you can get the wrong direction from a monopolist. You can get the wrong direction from many cowboys who are all trying to become monopolists. But it is true that the tech sector has become incredibly monopolized in the United States, uh, you know. And it's not, you know, the, uh, the the tech apologists would say, yeah, of course, it's monopolized because Google is so much better than all the others. That's why everybody uses Google. Well, that's not the truth. The truth is that Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook have been on a spending spree to buy all their competitors and to do an incredible amount of lobbying. These companies had no lobbying you know, 20 years ago, and now they are the biggest lobbyers the world has ever seen. And they have both, each one of them has both dozens of competitors, in many cases, buying and putting their technologies aside so that they don't turn into competitors. So they are manufacturing a system that creates no competition against them. And that, of course, has a lot of problems, both in terms of the direction of technology, who's going to benefit from technology, who's going to be able to control technology. And look at AI, same thing. Uh, 
OpenAI Microsoft partnership has uh, gobbled up all the resources. You know, Sam Altman wants to raise another three, seven trillion dollars. You know, what competitive environment? But is there a consciousness about uh, this in uh, American politics? I'm think I'm just thinking about uh, some research that I don't know whether Monika Schnitzer here in Germany did about the Bell Lab uh, or the Bell uh, company breakup, which brought about a lot of innovation. Absolutely. Actually, Absolutely. Right? yeah, breakups and, can and sometimes so do. they can be good. But, they can um, be good. And, and I, here I, I am. Even... I, I think that's what economic theory says. It can be good. It can be bad. I think there are more conditions under which it can be good than bad, but but let's not just pretend that it's, this is just a competition problem. Yeah. So I, this is a very important issue because I talk to a lot of regulators and some people in the United States, and they always look at it in the through the lenses of competition. No, you're not going to solve the social media problem if you break up Facebook into Facebook, <clears throat> WhatsApp, and Instagram. They're all going to continue to manipulate consumers and create mental health problems for teenagers and monetize people's data. I don't think that's going to change anything. So you need more than antitrust. You need more than just competition policy. But yes, lack of competition can be a very stifling factor, especially if you're after new technologies, new paradigms, like, for example, helping workers, helping democracy. That's not going to come out of the Facebook's business model. So, so we have to worry about that. And yes, it is partly a conscious choice. Bell Labs, which was already a very, very innovative lab, by the way, understood that if if they did not play the role of a monopoly, new competitor would come out. And I think many of these tech platforms understand. And, uh, and the venture capital funding model is very conducive to monopolization in the tech industry. Why? Because venture capital pours money into whatever becomes their darling, such as OpenAI today. And it's... Uh, on the premise of not making money, these companies for decades don't make money. It's on the prem promise of becoming bigger and bigger and taking more and more data, monopolizing data. And that, of course, is a recipe for destroying competition. But then perhaps today it's a lot more, it's not only about antitrust, et cetera, but it's perhaps about thinking about um well property rights for data and who owns data right is that something we need to think about much yeah absolutely 100 percent, nicola so i would say i think our focus should be on a number of things you know are we doing too much automation i think sidelining humans too much is going to be a disaster for the future <laughs> are we uh, creating too much of a manipulative environment in which a lot of the revenues of the tech industry comes from collecting people's data and then monetizing that in the form of manipulative ads. So I think we need to introduce better legislation. We I have advocated the tax on digital ad revenues. That's quite significant so that it creates a room for alternative models. But data markets go beyond that. Mm -hmm. AI is going to have more and more need for data. Who's going to get compensated for it? But also who's going to produce the high quality data? Uh, I believe that the potential of AI will not be realized if you have these mega gargantuan models, even if they are built on $7 trillion, and then they, they learn to speak like humans on the basis of what they read on social media and Reddit. <clears throat> you need high quality data that will help these models to become tools for workers, but then who's going to invest in this high quality data? So we need a property rights on data or market structure for data and also collective bargaining rights on data, just like you need collective bargaining rights for workers in the 19th century. We also need a better tax system so that you know firms are not subsidized for introducing machines ahead of workers. Right now in the United States and in many OECD countries, we <clears throat> favor capital and tax labor. We subsidize firms when they introduce machinery. We tax them and the workers when they hire workers. So, so there are many dimensions, and also it's all political. You know, more political yeah. voice and more democracy. Yes, democracy has its problems and will continue to have its problems, <laughs> but I don't see any other way out of it. But it's so. Uh, I mean, lots of work to do, and very interesting. Also, about you know. Uh, uh, touching on every uh, aspect almost of e economic policy. 
but it goes so fast. Do you think we will, it seems to go much faster than in the past or does it just feel like it? And will we, will we be able to catch up with it and find the right solutions? What do you think? Yeah, I think we can. Look, uh, first of all, how fast it goes is also a policy decision. Mm -hmm. We don't need, you know, speed is not something to be celebrated always. The world would have been a much better place if uh, it took 10 years for uh, Facebook to reach 2 billion users. Uh, so, and, and look, European Union uh, has become very informed and very good at understanding the regulatory issues related to AI. And there is also a much better level of understanding among American lawmakers. Four or five years ago, nobody in uh, uh, in Washington cared about AI. And today, many of them are actually quite informed about it. So yes, I think uh, lawmakers can muscle up. So we almost passed our time, but I have one last question for you. Because, I mean, of course, in these tech companies, it's already today that there was some, you know, polarization of the labor market that you explored. So it's mostly um, um, high-skilled workers there. And high-skilled workers who work with their brains, usually they're not very prone to thinking about unionizing it, at least not outside of Hollywood, let's say. Uh, so do you think we need a, workers need a new approach to basically be uh well also in the driver's seat do we need to think about new types of trade unions? oh 100 percent. yeah i should have emphasized that earlier and it's a major point of uh emphasis in the book with simon you cannot really think of true countervailing powers against companies without some sort of worker organization but worker organizations which have been in decline everywhere but especially in the united states are even more important when we are talking of redirecting technological change so if we want from these technologies to be pro-worker meaning help workers become more productive better at their jobs more versatile who knows that better than the workers themselves you think that you know uh somebody in silicon valley is going to decide how the world's workers should do their jobs better than the workers who have, you know, decades of knowledge about the production processes in which they're involved. So I think the worker voice is critical if we're really going to be able to steer this technology in a beneficial direction. Perfect. And well, I said it was the last question, but I have one last for you. Uh, that on, do you already work with AI to uh, to to write your papers even faster and explain? No, I it? do not. I. Uh, I had access to GPT-4 before it was released, and I experimented with it. There were some impressive parts, but you could see already the unreliability, and I, I was never tempted. I think the human creative element is not going to be replicated anytime soon, nor uh, would we have the same value out of it if it was a machine doing it. Well, we're on the same wavelength, and I do re realize when I did my little speech, I set the machine up for failure. But you know, I'm very content with that experience. <laughs> that was that was and... very good. Yes, I, I, I like that. <laughs> that on only 30 minutes, a bit more, and so much info. I thank you so much. Uh, have a great day, and continue uh, well with this kind of work. It's it's fascinating. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Nicola. It's great sharing the stage with you, and I hope our paths will cross again soon. Thank you.